All right, thank you for the very kind introduction and for um, the time today to everyone at Bioroom. I am Eliza Brett. I am speaking to you from Germany, but I'm Irish and um, I am the head of the biology research lab over here with the hand plastic reconstructive and burn surgery department at the University of Tübingen. And yeah, today I just, I, I'm so delighted to speak about the power of educated guesses because it's something that typically makes people a bit nervous in the lab when you approach your PI or when you approach your funding body and you illustrate your plan to make a guess. It's generally not a great reception on either side. But I argue today that if you are allowed to create a kind of a larger experiment around an educated guess, which is just another way of describing controlled imagination, it can give you some very interesting results. And part B of this here is that the, these results are also found by asking questions that don't end in a yes or a no, but in a what happens when, when you have a completely unknown output to whatever question that you're asking. And then also I've, my sister is a journalist and I am really taken with this idea of investigative journalism in in vitro research. All of my work is in vitro, which means it's a very fast turnaround. It's a lot cheaper than trying to genotype mice, et cetera. So I, I am aware of this and will proceed with such recognition. And lastly, of course, Regrettably, this is the closest I got to submitting a paper to Nature during the course of my PhD, but I tried and we did publish, um, just not in Nature, but we had some fun along the way and that's, you know, that's important. All right, I was described, this paper was described to me during a molecular oncology course in Munich where I did my PhD. It's called the epigenetic reprogramming of poorly aggressive melanoma cells by a metastatic microenvironment. Here's roughly what they did. The group cultured aggressive melanoma cells on a collagen matrix, like Matrigel, for example. And then three or four days later, they came back and decellularized this matrix. So the matrix was conditioned by these aggressive cells. And then they seeded poorly aggressive melanoma cells back onto that matrix. And they saw that the matrix had the power to convert those poorly aggressive melanoma cells into a more aggressive cancer phenotype. I remember in the lecture hall, it just blew my mind really. And this manuscript was the touch paper for my entire PhD. I approached, it was semester one, I didn't really know what I was at, but I approached my supervisor and I just said, I want to try because I'm gonna guess that culturing these two groups together for a week will give me some type of matrix at the end. And so the co-culture on the left is made of three cells. It's a triple negative breast cancer cell, it's very invasive a fibroblast and adipose derived stem cells. And on the right, it, what came to know as healthy matrix is just fibroblasts and adipose derived stem cells. I, this was the workflow, um, but you can just focus on the bottom row here. We seed them at day zero, one week of culture with vitamin C to induce collagen production. And seven days later, I decellularized with ammonium hydroxide and Triton X. And I guess that there would be something left behind after a week's worth of culture. And here's what I found, shot on iPhone, obviously. The, this is a six well plate with four cover slips in each well, just to orient. On the left it is the cancer matrix. It's very smooth, it's glassy and kind of flat looking and linear. And on the right is this healthy matrix. It seemed to me to be really fluffy and kind of dimensional. My entire PhD became, why does that look like that? And uh, there's only one cell type between these two that's different what's going on here. Fortunately, I had an advisor who kind of let me design my own data output. And so atomic force microscopy was great for this particular for this um, matrix analysis. It's just like the needle of a record player bouncing along the top of the sample. And it was also nice to add a bit of eye candy into the paper, which I did. So as expected, I ran Scanning electron microscopy is the grayscale images on top and atomic force microscopy are these colored ones on the bottom. 
The cancer matrix looks very smooth. It's very flat. Uh, there, it's linear. The, you, there are 3D lines here of collagen that you can kind of track with your eyes. And then the healthy matrix is a really rich meshwork. There's some intersections here, here, this one here, the one here. Uh, it's random. And so this began to catch some imaginations of my collaborators at this point, and I was happy about that. Then I asked, what happens when I grow cancer cells on these matrices? And this was another kind of open-ended question because I didn't know. On the healthy matrix, we just have a normal monolayer of cancer cells. But on the cancer matrix, there are these roads beginning to form. And we thought, oh, sugar, these cancer cells are organizing themselves. I'm going to say this means something bad. This is bad news when cancer looks like it's getting organized. We went really deep into this whole idea. I mean, we were talking about how the Roman Empire, you know, created itself and it's because they had road technology and then this is metastatic cancer. And yeah, I, I, I lost my mind a little bit, but in the best way possible at this particular point. Some of these roads were really sophisticated. They're set up nodules, headed to B, down to C and down to D. And at this point, I would like to impart the one real tip that I would have from this talk um, that I've learned myself over time is that if you avoid a question that ends in a maybe a dead end no or maybe a kind of a not a fantastic if it ends in a yes or a no then that's it but if you end in a I don't know what's going to happen it might lead on to something like what we're leading on to right now so at this point I thought this is either all a fluke or I'm doing something wrong so it was time to visit the literature and luckily it didn't take too long to find that other people had described linear collagen in breast cancer in the past. Actually, there was a system described in, back in 2006 called tumor associated collagen signatures. Tax one, two and three is basically a system describing different shells of collagen radiating out from the tumor. But for this one, we're only going to focus on tax three, these linear protrusions that are that the tumor is just sending out. And I thought that sounds familiar. Then I began to think all of this stuff in the dish, you know, what is it? The literature told me that collagen six is found at the invasive front of the tumor. And after some very difficult mass spec, um, the mass spectrometry results here are extremely simplified. But I just wanted to show that collagen six is more abundant was more abundant in the cancer matrix compared to the healthy one. So making sense so far. And it was the same when I took that information and stained um, with antibodies in immunohistochemistry. The green color here is collagen six. On the right is the border of the tumor. The dark tissue is actually adipocytes, it's fat tissue. And here's this nice line of linear green collagen six coming from the tumor. So we're getting closer to something, don't know yet. The question I then needed to ask was, what are the molecular signals that are flying around these dishes as the matrix is being deposited? We can forget about group B for the moment, actually forever. <laughs> okay, long story short, I ran an 87 cytokine blot, but there was only one that was upregulated in the cancer matrix compared to the healthy one, and that was CCL5. CCL5 is very, very, very well described in the literature in breast cancer, and I wanted to see now, uh, but, but it's generally described as a chemotactic chemical to bring in cell populations. I began thinking, does CCL5 have another role in constructing these linear roads that means the cells can infiltrate easily? Is there a physical role to CCL5 in the tumor? So what do you do? You make a guess that when you block it in the during the seven days with an antibody block with a I, I used a monoclonal antibody. Um, what happens to the matrix? The top is what we already know. And on the bottom, this is when CCL5 is blocked. It's this amorphous kind of mess. It looks just like a like mash. There's you have lost the linearity. You've lost the organization and Blocking CCL5 here seems to have inhibited this linear collagen formation. Many, many, many experiments later, um, we showed at the end of the PhD uh, an unreported cell relationship at the, well, pe people know this one already, when the, the membrane of an adipose derived stem cell touches that of a cancer cell, CCL5 is produced. But what we were able to show at the end was that the CCL5 acts on the local fibroblasts and they produce the linear collagen six. And this finding tied together these worlds of literature that 
had until then not been connected. And I was lucky and happy to have just wonderful co-workers in Munich that helped me publish a little bit over the course of my PhD. And so finally, my, my closing argument is that if you're allowed to have to, to work the imagination a little bit, and if someone will let you take a risk in an experiment that doesn't have a clear ending, you can get a body of research that you can logically follow, a discovery that you can build on, that you can enthuse collaborators with, and bring in money and publish. And then if you embed your findings in the research, you can have confidence, you can come to something like BioRoom and share your research with people. And you, you know, it feels great. And this is what it's all about. And I was extremely lucky and, and empowered during that PhD program. So I thank you all for your attention. And I'll be delighted to take any questions. <laughs>